Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Siegel. I'm an endocrinologist and a professor of medicine at the University of Calgary, and I've been doing physical activity research for more than 20 years. I'm the lead author of this chapter on physical activity and diabetes in the 2018 Clinical Practice Guidelines. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Marnie Armstrong, Simon Bacon, Norman Boulet, Kaberi Descupta, Glenn Kenny, and Meg Riddell. Now, I was also playing this role five years ago with the 2013 guidelines chapter. And since then, there has been important new information on a few topics, including the importance of minimizing sedentary time, uh, the importance of setting exercise goals and prescriptions, uh, the role of step count monitoring with pedometer or accelerometer, and for people with type 1 diabetes, strategies to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia during and after exercise. For most people, we'd like them to achieve the following, to try to do a minimum of 150 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise every week. This should be spread over at least three days. So one could do 50 minutes three times a week, one could do 37 and a half minutes four times a week or half an hour five days a week. We also would like people to include resistance exercise training or strength training at least twice a week to set physical activity goals and when possible involve a multidisciplinary team such as diabetes educators, kinesiologists, and so on. And also to minimize uninterrupted sedentary time. Each of these recommendations is evidence-based. Now, for most people, assessment before exercise does not involve more than would normally be done periodically to surveil people with diabetes for complications. So one should look for evidence of neuropathy, of advanced retinopathy, uh, evidence on history or physical of coronary disease symptoms. Um, a resting ECG should be done periodically for most middle-aged and older people with diabetes. And peripheral arterial disease can also be a marker of elevated vascular risk. Now, for the great majority of people, being sedentary is far more risky, far more harmful to their health than any form of exercise is likely to be. But there are the exceptions, such as those with unstable cardiovascular disease, and it's best to take steps to try to identify them and stabilize them before undertaking especially vigorous exercise. What you're seeing here is a screenshot. It's not a slide I expect you to read right now but rather to show that there is a lot of material available at the Diabetes Canada website on this topic and others. And this screenshot is just one example, a physical activity interactive decision tool. For aerobic exercise, we would like everyone to build to 150 minutes a week, but not all can manage this right at the start. Some are very deconditioned. If that is the case, set a more modest goal initially and gradually build up over time. For example, start by asking the patient to walk five minutes a day or five minutes twice a day, and gradually increase this over a period of weeks until the 50 minutes three times a week or 150 minutes a week are achieved. And for those who have difficulty finding a longer period of time consecutively available for exercise, it is equally acceptable to do several shorter periods, for example, three 10 minute periods of brisk walking rather than one 30 minute period during a day. Resistance exercise or strength training. Uh, we recommend choosing six to eight exercises, collectively targeting all of the major muscle groups. So including arms, chest, back, legs, and abdomen. The strength of resistance, in other words, the amount of weight lifted, the amount of resistance they work against should be gradually increased until they are able to perform no more than eight to 10, eight to 12 repetitions rather of each exercise with one to two minutes of rest between each, sets of, each set of the same exercise. 
Now, when beginning resistance exercise, it is really ideal to first receive initial instruction and periodic supervision by a qualified exercise specialist. Uh, this will help maximize the benefits and minimize risk of injury. Now, it is not hard to find people who can do this. Any YMCA will have people who can provide rudimentary initial instruction on resistance exercise training, how to start a program. Interval exercise or interval training has become an increasingly popular form of exercise. In general, this involves doing exercise at varying intervals over time. That is, varying, alternating intervals of higher intensity exercise with intervals at lower intensity exercise. This can shorten the total exercise duration, it can increase fitness gains, and can increase variety while reducing boredom. Uh, an easy way to do this would be to alternate between three minutes of faster walking and three minutes of slower walking. Uh, those who are more ambitious or who like very vigorous exercise can alternate 30 seconds at very high or near maximal exercise with 90 seconds at a much lower intensity. Doing this type of exercise tends to increase fitness gains with a lower overall time cost compared to continuous aerobic exercise. They're both perfectly good ways of exercising and it's a matter of which type of regimen the patient prefers. Particularly for people with arthritis who have difficulty with weight bearing, exercise in the water can be very beneficial and is often a very viable alternative. This can include walking briskly in the water, swimming, or classes that include a variety of exercises. Pedometers and accelerometers, like for example the Fitbit, are becoming increasingly popular. Now, these can be used to encourage people with diabetes or without for that matter to self-monitor their physical activity. Uh, it's best to ask them to record their values, to review them at their visits, and to set targets which in general will be a little more than they're doing now but not so much more that it becomes unachievable. And we have tools to provide prescriptions for this type of exercise logging. In addition, there is more and more evidence that's beneficial to break up sedentary time. If one must sit for a, long period, for a prolonged period of time, try to get up briefly every 20 to 30 minutes, ideally, and at least once an hour for about a minute, either to stand in place or ideally to walk around, even if it's a short walk. Here's an example of a written exercise prescription available at guidelines.diabetes.ca. This is actually the one based on the 2013 guidelines. The one based on the current 2018 guidelines should be available by mid-2018. This one that you see here is still serviceable. It just lacks the most recent recommendations on interval training and on minimizing sedentary time. Here's an example of a step count prescription also available at guidelines.diabetes.ca. So the general principle is that wherever the person is at the start in terms of steps per day, try to get them to agree to do a little bit more. If they're starting at, let's say in this range, 5,000 to 7,499, the middle category there, try to get them to increase this by 750 steps initially, by 1,000 starting at three months and more as time passes on. For resistance exercise, as I've mentioned before, it is best to get at least one individual session with an exercise trainer. But we also do have videos available and written materials, such as including photos, for those that might prefer to try to do this on their own. Again, at guidelines.diabetes.ca. There are a number of predictable problems that might occur time constraints during a patient-physician encounter can often interfere with the physician providing as much advice on this topic as he or she would like to. Now, it's not necessary that the physician be the one to provide all advice. 
uh, there are often other professionals available who can help, such as kinesiologists, physical therapists, diabetes educators, and caseworkers, who can also help motivate patients and inform them. Now, for those in whom you think that there may be pre-existing or, or suspected heart disease, for the great majority of these, it's still very beneficial for them to do exercise. But if they want to do vigorous activity uh, at a greater, greatly higher intensity than they're accustomed to, it's probably best to do a fairly careful evaluation, including a history and physical uh, focused on finding evidence of ischemia, doing a resting ECG for middle-aged and older people, and possibly an exercise ECG stress test if you're suspicious but uncertain of whether there is cardiovascular disease present. Get to know your community resources. In most communities, there are some resources available in the community that will make it easier, more practical, and more fun to do physical activity. Know what's available in your community. To reiterate the recommendations, people with diabetes should ideally accumulate at least 150 minutes a week of aerobic exercise at moderate to vigorous intensity, spread over at least three days of the week, with no more than two consecutive days without exercise to improve glycemic control and to reduce risk of cardiovascular and overall mortality. Now, for those who can't make those targets, it's still worthwhile to exercise. There's good evidence that smaller amounts of exercise in the 90 to 140 minutes per week range can also be beneficial, albeit to a lesser extent than larger volumes, both for glycemic control and for mortality. Interval training is a very viable option for most people. It can be recommended for those willing and able to do it, to increase trains, sorry, gains in cardiovascular fitness and to reduce risk of hypoglycemia in type 1 diabetes. People with diabetes, including and especially elderly people, should perform resistance exercise at least twice a week and preferably three times a week, in addition to aerobic exercise. And it's best to obtain initial instruction and periodic re-evaluation by an exercise specialist in order to maximize gain and to minimize risk of injury. In addition to achieving physical activity goals, people with diabetes and without diabetes, for that matter, should minimize the amount of time spent in sedentary activities and periodically break up long periods of sitting. Setting specific exercise goals, problem solving about potential barriers to physical activity, providing information on where and when to exercise, as well as self-monitoring should be performed collaboratively between the person with diabetes and the healthcare provider to increase physical activity and to improve hemoglobin A1c. Step count monitoring with a pedometer or accelerometer, which could include the patient's own smartphone, can be considered in combination with physical activity counseling, support, and goal setting to support and reinforce increased physical activity. Several strategies can be used alone or in combination to reduce risk of hypoglycemia associated with exercise in people with type 1 diabetes. First, reduce the bolus dose of the insulin that is most active at the time of exercise. For example, if exercise is to be formed an hour after a meal, reduce the pre-meal short-acting insulin dose. Second, significantly reduce or suspend basal insulin for the exercise duration and lower the basal overnight after exercise. By 20%. This is directed at people with insulin pump therapy. Three, increase carbohydrate consumption prior to, during, and or after exercise as necessary. This is particularly for prolonged exercise. Four, to reduce risk of hypoglycemia, perform brief maximum intensity sprints at the start of exercise, periodically during the exercise, or at the end of exercise. Fifth, 
perform resistance exercise before an aerobic exercise session. This will reduce risk of hypoglycemia during the aerobic exercise compared to doing just the, resist the aerobic exercise alone. Middle-aged and older people with diabetes who wish to undertake very vigorous or prolonged exercise, like competitive running, high-intensity interval training, and so on, should be assessed for conditions that might place them at increased risk for an adverse event with history, physical examination, resting ECG, and possibly exercise ECG stress testing. Structured exercise programs, supervised by qualified trainers, should be implemented when feasible for people with type 2 diabetes to improve glycemic control, cardiac risk factors, and physical fitness. Higher levels of physical activity and fitness are associated with lower morbidity and mortality in people with diabetes. This applies both to aerobic fitness and to strength. Both aerobic and resistance exercise are beneficial and is optimal to do both. We recommend at least 150 minutes a week of aerobic exercise and at least two sessions per week of resistance exercise, although smaller amounts still have some health benefits for those who are unable to achieve the 150 minutes. To increase physical activity, employ strategies like setting specific physical activity goals, using self-monitoring tools like pedometers or accelerometers, and developing plans to overcome anticipated barriers. Remember that habitual prolonged sitting is associated with increased risk of death and of major cardiovascular events. The key messages for people with diabetes are really the same as I've already presented in the preceding slides as outlined here. Strength training is important in addition to aerobic training. And doing some exercise is better than doing none, although it's not as good as fully meeting recommendations. The full guidelines, interactive tools, and other useful resources can be accessed on the guidelines website, guidelines.diabetes.ca. The information is also accessible on the Diabetes Canada app, available in the App Store for iOS and in the Google Play Store for Android. Thank you.